my fellow comic book collectors, it's Alan, the Comic Collector Geek, and this is the Wednesday video where I answer your questions. <laughs> um, we got some pretty great questions this week. If you have a question that you want answered, put it in the comments below and I will answer it next week. Um, I only do answer questions that in these videos that are in the video from the previous Wednesday, okay? If that I know people sometimes ask questions throughout the week. <laughs> I can't add all those questions. So if you want a question, you gotta put it into this video's comments. Okay, first question comes from JSS Brooklyn. What are your top five Wonder Woman covers by different artists? Okay, so um, one of them that is my one of my favorite covers uh, is a, a Boland cover. Uh, which is Wonder Woman number 71. It's the classic, her standing up one. I, I'm i trying to find it. <laughs> I don't know where I put... I have an extra box of Wonder Woman. I just can't find it. It's somewhere in this room. I just can't find it. I'll, I'll find it later and I'll be like, oh man, here it is. Okay, <laughs> but I can't find it. Um, so I'm looking for that book. But I brought five others. Uh, so that would have been a bonus one. Um, but I'm going to show you some. Uh, this is um, Irv Novak cover, and I always like these ones where um, you got a couple things going on with this. I like the ones where it's like a close-up of the face, and I also like uh, miniature people. I, <laughs> it's a weird thing. I like this kind of idea of a giant Wonder Woman and then a little mini Wonder Woman. So I, I really like this cover. I just think it's a cool cover. Um, there's another one where she's like uh, climbing a building that I really like as well, where uh, it looks like she's kind of mimicking a uh, King Kong kind of effect. Um, that's another one I really like as well. But this one I thought was pretty cool. So um, if you ask me this question any other day, I'll probably show you five different covers. But for today, <laughs> I really like this one. Uh, so this is uh, Irv Novak cover. And next one. And this one I actually think is really impressive. Uh, this is a more modern comic of Wonder Woman. This is Wonder Woman number one uh, from the second series. Uh, and this is George Perez. And I just think the amount of work, the amount of detail in this cover is just insane. You can see all the little statues here. I just think it's so crazy. And the way that he drew kind of Olympus, like uh, I think that's supposed to be Paradise Island, but it looks like Olympus and with all the gods above. Uh, just looks really, really cool. And then the back cover is amazing too. Actually, uh, the back cover is like insane. Just really awesome stuff. So I, I just really love this cover. So I think it's a really cool one. Um, so this is, uh, what does it say? Well, it's art by, art and story by George Perez. It says the new origin for Wonder Woman. Yeah, Greek gods appearance. Those are all the Greek gods. It's a really cool book. I just really like this one. So um, this is next one on my list. Now this next one is on the list because I actually think it's a really cool cover. Um, but it's more about like if you know uh, the, the original creator of one, uh, Wonder Woman, Marston, um, a bit more of his backstory, this cover becomes cooler. Uh, so this is Wonder Woman 53. And I like this cover. It's not maybe the most exciting cover out there, but the reason I like this cover is Marston, the guy that created Wonder Woman, was the one that also created the lie detector. <laughs> so this is Wonder Woman kind of going on, undergoing the lie detector test. And I just think that's, I don't know, it's, for me, it's like when I see this, I think of all that history and it's just, I think it's cool. It just makes me feel like, oh, wow, this is kind of a cool thing. I almost feel like this is Marston kind of doing that. I just feel like it's a bit of a self-insert a bit there. Um, and I just I just really like it. So this is um, this cover is done by um, Erwin Hassan and or Hassan and uh, Bernard Sachs. So I just think it's a really cool one. Just a really. And I like. Uh, the multi-layer effect that happens. You got the guy in the back, got Wonder Woman in the middle, and this sort of shadowy figure in the foreground. I just think it's really cool. I like this cover. <laughs> so sometimes 
you know, if you're forcing me to do five different artists, it becomes a little bit like this, where these are not necessarily ones. I if you said f top five, I probably put more of the same artist <laughs> repeatedly. But the next one, uh, and I actually really like this cover uh, for multiple reasons. Now, I just learned more about this book uh, recently, um, but I'm going to show it. Uh, so this is um, this is a really great Wonder Woman. This is Wonder Woman uh, 205, and it's a cover by Nick, Nick Cardi. Now, Nick Cardi is a great artist. <laughs> I really like Nick Cardi's work. Uh, his Aquaman stuff is amazing. But this one is extra cool because uh, this actually came out in my birth month. <laughs> so for me, and it like came out when I was born, basically. So really cool book, um, extra special for that. Uh, but it, I always like this cover. She's like in bondage on a bomb. It's like a classic uh, thing where, <laughs> I don't know, it's just such a cool, cool thing. Um, it just, you know, Wonder Woman's weak when she's in bondage. So this is extra cool that way. Uh, it's a really, really classic cover. So um, Wonder Woman 205. There's some really great bondage covers that, uh, that I didn't include the, on this list uh, that I could have. And I was debating about it. I kept with more to the slabs. I actually have a lot of raw copies that there's some really great uh, bondage and cool covers um, sort of in that period where she was doing the, the non-suit version of Wonder Woman. A lot of really great bondage covers in that era where she was more of a feminist. <laughs> it's sort of funny that she used more in bondage covers when she was a feminist. It totally doesn't make any sense, but that's how it was. Uh, the next one, uh, and this is a really great cover, and this is, this is one like, there's the, the three big Wonder Woman books, right? They, you got All-Star 8, you got Wonder Woman number one, which is right there, which is a great cover too. I really love that cover too. So don't get me wrong, that's a great cover. But then you got this one. This is the, 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 the third of the, the big books, but I love this cover. Um, and I love it for, again, <laughs> a bit more, there's more reasons to uh, loving this cover. It's, when I see this, uh, it has like a couple things that really kind of stand out to me. Um, it is her first cover appearance. And one of the things, like if you look at Detective 38, for example, you have uh, Robin jumping through that little circle thing. Well, Wonder Woman's kind of doing that on this cover where she's kind of being presented and kind of coming out. And I think that's cool. Uh, I like the fact that she's bouncing the bullets off her bracelets. I, I think that's cool. It's almost like the guys are aiming for her bracelets, but <laughs> we'll ignore that part. Uh, I just like the, 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 the fact that she's leaping into action. Um, there's sort of this very 3D dimension, like 3D effect on this book where you see the, the kind of like the line kind of going into the book from both sides where you have the Capitol buildings and it sort of kind of sucks you into the comic. It kind of brings, focuses your eyes around here, which is strange, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I just, I, I, I just think it's a really cool, uh, cool cover. And this one is actually an interesting one. I actually just want to point out something totally not related, but something cool about this book. Now, this is obviously a first print. This is like, it's a 0.5. It's, it's not, it's a still expensive book, but uh, it is a 0.5. But you can tell first prints versus later printings. Now they did reprint this book. And one of the things that they did is they, they create subtle differences in order to uh, maintain the integrity of the, the first print versus later printing. And one of the things that they did is um, if you see next to the Wonder Woman, there's like this apostrophe. Um, that is only on the first print. <laughs> um, when I say later printings, I mean like much, much later. I mean the reprints of the book. Um, you know, they they won't have that. So a lot of the time you see these Luke Crate uh, versions and they won't have that apostrophe. Something to look forward. Uh, I had somebody that was trying to pass off um, uh, one of these reprints as the original. Uh, the size is slightly different and also there are those subtle differences as well. So very cool book. I love this one. It's it's my favorite Wonder Woman cover. Always in conflict with Wonder Woman number one. Those are my two big favorites. Okay so I hope you enjoyed that. Oh and the artist on that was uh, H.G. Peters. 
who did most of uh, the Wonder Woman Golden Age books. So there's that too. <laughs> okay. Um, next question comes from Matt Likes Comics. Uh, Sun Girl comes across as really bright. I think he's kind of joking there. <laughs> Has she ever made a comeback after the Golden Age? Um, I think she did. Um, but I don't think like she was ever like a big character ever again. Like, you know, it's not like she's a modern character. Um, a lot of these characters from the Golden Age really haven't been brought back. I, I do believe that um, some of these characters, they like the one I can think of is like Phantom Lady, where they kind of redid her and brought her back. Um, I don't know if they've done the same with uh, Sun Girl. But uh, yeah, so I'd say no. <laughs> Um, K. Munin wrote, on your September 2nd live stream, you showed a CBCS uh, copy of Chamber of Chills 19, which is that one right there. You can see it. Actually, it comes out really well on the video, which is awesome. Um, and uh, am I mistaken, or did you already own a raw copy of that book? No, I did not own <laughs> another copy. If I did own another copy, I wouldn't have bought that copy um, because I, I don't really like buying duplicates unless it's a major upgrade and the price isn't too like imposing um, so yeah um, what is the most nervous you have ever been when buying an expensive comic uh, probably the very first big comic that I bought uh, which was my all-star eight that was the one that kind of like put me in this whole space of I can actually go after big books um that was a bit of a bit of a risk for me I, I was like you know when there was there were so many things I was nervous about when buying that book because I bought a raw copy of it and I actually did a lot of research before buying it and I did trust the dealers so you know there was that um but I was very nervous spending that much on a book up till then, maybe the most I've spent on a comic was maybe $500. So when it was like that, like $20,000 range, <laughs> all of a sudden, like, that's a big jump. Uh, and that was a, that was a bit scary, bit, bit scary. Um, I, I never thought I would spend that much money on a comic. Even when I bought that 500, I thought, oh, I'll never spend <laughs> more than this on any comic in the future. Uh, but, um, yeah, it, it was one of those things, um, but it really did open my eyes to going after these bigger books. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. But that one I was very nervous about. And like, even just the fact that I could take it home and I was like, oh my goodness, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> like, oh, how am I going to take care of this book? I was almost like bringing home a baby in a way. Um, next question comes from Star Child. Would you swap your entire collection for Action Comics 1? In a grade that would uh, be worth slightly more than what you have. Um, if not, is there a comic that you would trade everything for? Um, so I, I get this question a lot. Would you trade all of your books to get one book, uh, like a Detective 27 or some big book that you could say, oh, I have this big book. Um, I, I'm not that kind of collector. I'm really not. Um, there are people that uh, would curate their collection down to 20 books. And I know a lot of collectors that do that, where they have like a very small collection, but their collection is like, wow. <laughs> you just go, wow, they're, it's an amazing collection. Um, the reason I buy low grades is I want a variety of books. that I There's a lot of books that I really like. Um, and the reason I, you know, buy all the different books that I do is I, I, I do really love these books. You know, to me, Chamber of Chills, that's an awesome book. Wonder Woman 1, that's an awesome book. Having both of those in my collection is awesome. Having just one of them, you know, would not be as cool. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not that kind of collector that wants a small collection. Probably it's more practical to have a small collection, but um, there's so many things that I, I'd love to have the first of or you know uh have copies of i just i'm just too eager to have a big collection um i'm a bit of a hoarder that way uh and hoarders don't really like getting rid of all their stuff and maybe that's 
maybe that's where I come from. I just, I like to have a variety of comics. Um, I couldn't just trade it all for one. And there's no real big books that would replace all of this for me. I mean, the only way I would do it is if, um, for example, if I traded everything, like let's say my collection's worth a couple million dollars, and I traded everything, and then I got a book like um, Action Comics number one, as you said, and it's worth $10 million, okay? Um, you know, because it's the highest grade or whatever. I got that in trade. And then I would be like, okay, now I'm selling this book and buying back my own collection because that'd be what I would do. I would just, you know, I'd actually keep the Action 1 but buy a lower grade copy of it and then use the extra money to buy back my collection. So um, that's how I'd probably roll on that. Um, okay, so the next question. Uh, comes from uh, Kim uh, Nugent. Uh, and um, what is what is the atomic age of comics? The golden age of comics describes an era in history of American comic books from 1938 to 1956. Um, actually, I'll push back a little bit on that last date. So the golden age comics is actually 1938, which is the first appearance of Superman, Action 1, uh, but 1955 is really when um, the Golden Age ends. And you could even say maybe slightly earlier because um, the books that um, were being produced in the four, 54, 1954 really were ones that um, were impacted by what I'm about to say. Uh, that the Comic Code Authority came in March of 1954, or 55. So all books after March of 1955 had the Comic Code Authority on them. Uh, but those books were actually created earlier. <laughs> so, but really that March of 54, a uh, fifth, 55, I should say, March of 55 is the date that the Golden Age really ended. Because the Golden Age is really that time period where comics were free in terms of what the people could do. Like they could do, like, you know, there were exceptions, but for the most part, there was a lot of freedom. Uh, within the golden age they could create crazy covers um, and have crazy content and that was all lost when uh, the comic code authority came into play um, it really marked the end of that era now what is atomic age atomic age is actually defined as an age where um, the atomic bomb had been dropped uh, it meant a few things for not only the world but for comics as well um, it marked a real stark uh, surprise to humanity that we could wipe out ourselves instantly with the atomic bomb and the atomic age of life. <laughs> you know, it wasn't just comics, but it was atomic age. We have come into the atomic age once we dropped that bomb and we saw the impacts of it. Um, it also marked the end of the Second World War. And when the Second World War ended, um, it was a difference in what people wanted to see. So a lot of the wartime books had wartime content, um, had a lot of Hitler stuff, Nazi stuff, Japanese stuff. Well, that had to shift. <laughs> you know, people didn't want that content anymore. I mean, there was still some demand for war books. I'm not saying that they weren't. Um, but what was happening was um, people wanted to get a, sort of step away from the war. Uh, they wanted their heroes they didn't really want superheroes anymore because they were associated to the war and things like good girl westerns um crime books um different genres all of a sudden started appearing in this new age which is the atomic age now the atomic age is one of those ones that's kind of loosely defined um because it, really it starts 1946 it's overlapping on the golden age so the golden age is, as i said stops in 1955 but you got this atomic age that's kind of superimposed upon the Golden Age. Uh, and so it starts in 1946 and then runs all the way up to 1960 at the very extreme end of it. Um, what you have to look at at that, you know, some people say 1956, some people say 1960. It's sort of like, again, a fuzzy era. It's not as clearly defined as the Golden Age. The Golden Age is very, it starts here, ends here, and really specific dates, actually. Um, but the atomic age, not so much. It's sort of, <laughs> it's sort of there. Um, but things that sort of led to the new age, which was 
uh, the Silver Age and the, the Atomic Age kind of overlaps onto the Silver Age as well, were things like the reappearance of the superhero comics, the redevelopment of Marvel and DC, where Showcase um, with uh, Flash, you know, all of a sudden is the book uh, that led to the new age of the Silver Age. And you could say there was books in that kind of sweet spot in between the fall of the Golden Age and the Silver Age, but um, where the Comic Code Authority, and there were differences there, uh, those are all sort of atomic. Um, and really, the if you look at even DC books, like um, you got Showcase, you got, uh, for Wonder Woman, it was Wonder Woman number 98, which was like 1958, <laughs> you know, it's much later. So the Silver Age, what is considered the first Silver Age of those characters, was when they were redefined in a new way, um, more of a moving away from that Golden Age version of the character into a new era. Um, so the, the Atomic Age is kind of fuzzy in that respect because things were getting redefined at different periods. Uh, Marvel got redefined in the early 60s. Um, DC, it's really from like showcase all the way up to the early 60s that it's getting redefined. So that's why Atomic Age is that, has that weird fuzzy end. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> but that's kind of the, the logic behind it. Um, Sean um, uh, Magian, I'm going to hopefully not brutalize your name too much, uh, wrote... Um, what is it? What is your take on Roy Thomas's Golden Age retroactive continuity, as seen uh, in the Invaders Marvel and All Star Squadron DC? For instance, Thomas created a different character uh, named Golden Girl, who joined Bucky and Toro in uh, Kid Commandos. Uh, it's also sort of a revamping of the Young Allies concept, but without the stereotypes. I wish Marvel would re-release. Uh, release uh, facsimile editions of the first Blonde Phantom, Namora, Sun Girl, Golden Girl as appearances. Um, so I would actually, <laughs> maybe that's a nice thing. I, I, I really don't like the the rehashing or the, the facsimiles, but, um, but maybe you would get some people interested in those books. I, I, I kind of I'm very against reprints for the most part. I know people like them. I, I, I feel it takes away from the, the coolness of the original and the fact that it is scarce. I, maybe I am a bit of a, a gatekeeper that way. Um, but, uh, but my take on what Roy Thomas did and this whole idea of uh, the invaders and stuff is I always see them as alternate timelines. Like, you know, in DC, it's like Earth 1, Earth 2, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I kind of like that concept of um, having uh, different universes uh, and where you can tell different stories. Um, I think that's fun. I think that's a cool idea um, because it, it does inspire different types of story writing. Uh, and I, I'm all for that. Um, you know, in a way, uh, it can mess up the continuity, like where you like Superman's acting completely different in this series versus this series, the, you know, this universe. Um, but I, I do believe that it kind of allows for that creativity. So I, I'm all for it. I do like sort of the classic storytelling. So I, I kind of like if they can bring that sort of golden age storytelling into a modern audience, um, I'm all for it. So um, that'd be my take on it. Uh, you also asked, um, also, are you collecting any of the timely or pre-timely pulp magazines that M Martin Goodman published, like Kazar number one from 1936. I don't actually collect those. Um, there are some pretty cool ones. They're like the Marvel stories, or, or I think it's Marvel stories. Um, those are pretty cool. I don't collect them though. I don't really have that big of a pulp collection. Uh, I do have some, like I, I say I don't have a big collection, but I have about 200 pulps. <laughs> um, but most of my pulps are more geared to the good girl art covers um, or science fiction, uh, like cool first appearances within science fiction. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really get into pulps that much. Um, I do like the fact that they're now slabbing the pulps so you get these beautiful covers, but I don't really go after the timely ones. So, um, 
MJ Chick asked, um, I'm in a group that does not like slabs. I feel like I, I like the feel and the smell of old paper. Uh, I can actually read them if I want. What's the purpose of having a book if you can't read it and um, other than prestige and money? Okay, well, um, there's more to it than that. Um, so, in a way, this video, the whole time this video is going on, actually show why slabs are actually useful. Um, I love seeing my comics. I'm not going to read these all the time. Um, and I don't need to smell them. This room would smell gross if, I, if it was smelling like Golden Age comics. The fact that I can see them and I can present them really does appeal to me. That's the appeal for me. Uh, especially like, for example, Chamber of Chills, which I actually just re read for the first time like a few days ago. Like I, after I bought I got the slab, I read the stories. Um, you know, it's all about the cover. And having it in the slab protects the book. Um, so I don't need to smell it. I don't need to touch it. I, I, I just want to see that cover. I'm very visual and, the you know, so I, I like seeing that book. Um, so this display behind me really showcases my desire for the comics that I really am passionate about being able to see the books um, and display them. Now, if they're floppy or... You know, I couldn't really do that. Um, other big thing with slabs is the fact that, it, you know, it does commodify them, which is in an important part of the whole thing as well, where um, if you do have to sell them, you can do so easily. Um, so there is, you know, there is that element to it, uh, which is the money part of it. Uh, we don't, as collectors, we don't really like to think about that part too much <laughs> we do think about it um, but it is important to understand that these books are something that uh, we we should protect and you know putting them in a slab does protect that investment so sorry that uh, I can't agree with you on this one but uh, I do personally prefer slabs I actually go out and actively find slabs so that's just my way I, everybody collects differently uh, William Barrett wrote Great show as Alan. Uh, a great show as always, Alan. What is that? Uh, how do you spell your name? Okay. <laughs> so um, I spell my name A A L L A N. So two L's and an A N. Okay. So if you ever want to know how to spell my name, um, and um, next question comes from A J Guiz, who wrote, um, "How can we join?" The members part of this channel so there is a members section to this channel where i kind of put content that i can't put for uh maybe younger audiences um so i put it in my members only section uh to join the members only section it's really easy you just go you click on my channel link uh you'll see like my like about uh you'll see a tab that says members click that and you can join it's really that easy um there was one more question that i skipped over somehow um, oh yes, I skipped this one question by accident, um, but I had it prepared. So, um, uh, Av, Avra, Avra, uh, Orlando wrote, um, our average, I think I remember seeing this one, average Orlando, Orlando, Orlando. Okay, average Orlando. That's what it is. I, I knew that he he told me that it was something different. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out the guy's name um, because it's all weird letters. Okay, so um, hello, Alan. You have a wonderful collection. How many Schomburg covers do you have, your favorites, and do you want to add some more? Personally, I love the his work on Captain America. I agree. Uh, his Captain America stuff is awesome. Um, I actually really like his Green Hornet stuff, too both of which I don't have. <laughs> I don't have much of those. Um, but I have probably about, I would guess, I'm going to guess anywhere from 100 to 200 comics with Alex Schomburg covers. I'll show you some of my favorites. Um, but I'm a big fan of Alex Schomburg. He's one of my top three artists. Maybe even my number, I would say maybe my number one, actually. <laughs> um, I really do like Alex Schomburg. Um, so I 
I have a fairly big uh, Alex Schomburg collection. I'd actually say maybe 300 books. It's a pretty big collection of Alex Schomburg stuff in my collection. I'm going to just show you some slabs and one raw. So I'll show you the raw first because it's kind of my one of my favorites <laughs> of Alex Schomburg. And it's really this one. Uh, this is Startling Comics number 49. And it's the classic Bender cover. I just think it's just such a cool cover. I just love it. Um, I just like the way the 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 shininess of the metal of the robot. I love robot covers anyways. I think they're fun. I like the girl in the red dress. I like the bondage. I like the fact that the hero is just always too late to save the girl. Um, I just, you know, it's a classic. Alex Schomburg, it's airbrush cover. It's a Zila cover as well, where he writes his name backwards as Zila. You know, there's so many things that I just really love about this. There's this weird uh, forced depth perception as well. Um, just a whole bunch of great things about this one. Love the water. It's just a great cover. So <laughs> definitely one of my favorites. Um, uh, another series that I really like, uh, because he did a lot of good girl covers, and you'll notice that generally it's the good girl covers that I go for with Alex Schomburg, is um, exciting. Um, I really like this one especially uh, because there's this weird motion that's kind of, if you look, he does this a lot on Exciting where he creates almost these weird angles where you'll notice like um, this one has an angle that's like that, you know, from the tail to the paw, you see this weird angle and her leg kind of fits into that angle. Just these weird little things that really draw the eye. But the other thing that I like about it is her skirt's really short. <laughs> I just think it's really cool. Lots of leg, beautiful cover, lots of nice airbrush one. Just a really, really fun cover uh, with Judy of the Jungle. Uh, just a really great one. So Alex Schomburg's uh, exciting, com uh, exciting Comics number 61. Okay, this next one uh, is not a good girl one um, because I, I wanted to show that it's not all about the girls for me, but I, I I do really, really love this cover. I wish I had a better grade of it. It's, mine's a little rough, but I really love this one just because it is such a classic cover. Um, you got the, the Nazis and they're, they're injecting chocolate with poison. <laughs> you know, it's like just so cool. And then you got the Nazis outside and they're handing the poison, poison chocolate bars to the kids. Just such a great pop propaganda cover. And that was one of the things that Alex Schomburg was really good with, uh, is creating these uh, propaganda covers. And this is one of the cool ones. I'm going to show a few because they're some of my favorite covers are the propaganda ones. I just love the details that he puts into the comic covers and um, just the, you know, just the coolness of the propaganda that he's creating. That this, you know, this whole idea of like the poisoned uh, candy bars and uh, I like the little swastika kind of dangling down and you got the two heroes this time they're actually not late like they usually are uh, Bucky uh, no, what's the black terrorist uh, sidekick I, I forgot his name um, is about to shoot the guy that's outside uh, the black terror is like taking out these Nazis so just a really cool book okay and another one I really like and again, it's all about the details. So with Alex Schomburg, it's just crazy details. I love this one. Just, I I love shark covers. Uh, I love this situation where you got the sharks <laughs> in the pool of water and the, the guys dangling over it. I just think that's cool. Um, and uh, you got the, the typical, the way he draws the Japanese uh, is really this, you know, kind of where they have this really bad eyesight bad teeth <laughs> just like total racial stereotypes uh i think it's funny um because you know i understand the era this is coming from where the japanese are evil you know that's what you have to understand that that this is where you know the u.s is at war with japan and the japanese are the evil enemy and you got to portray them in the most you know bad light as possible um and that's that's what they did <laughs> i mean and Alex Schomburg was really, you know, trying to inspire the war effort. Um, and this is a really great example. So this is Young Allies, number eight. Just a great cover. Lots of stuff going on there. Uh, one more propaganda war cover. And I've shown this many times, but I really do love this book. Uh, it's a Hitler cover. 
and this one has has the most swastikas of any comic book cover ever uh it's just a great one you got hitler in bondage you got mussolini under the bed you got them doing target practice at mussolini you got him getting this top secret documents that are labeled top secret <laughs> it's like what why would you do that uh actually secret orders sorry they're labeled secret orders i mean you know if you're gonna put your secret orders somewhere you gotta label it secret orders i mean come on uh, you know, in this, like, this way to the air raid shelter. I love those little details that he put in. I love the little uh, skulls on the bedposts. You know, stuff like that. It's just awesome. So, I love these propaganda covers. They're really great. And they show Hitler as being, like, a total, <laughs> a total uh, wet noodle. Uh, just awesome. And then we got two of my favorite um, Good Girl covers by Alex. We got Miss Fury. Which is just the the thing that I love about this cover is uh, like her legs are just like <laughs> they're just like they're they're completely straight uh, and they're just incredibly long. I just think that's really interesting. Uh, I love this swoosh that she's coming down on. I just think it's a really cool cover. Um, one of his best, in my opinion, for for action and for um, he like superhero kind of covers. I just really like this one. You know, it's like not only is she swooshing in, but there's just every like all the chaos that is caused by her swooshing in. She's literally taking out three guys. It's just so impressive. Um, and like all the destruction around. I just think it's a really cool cover. So this is Miss Fury number one. And last, my absolute favorite um good girl cover by uh, Alex Schomburg. This is actually my favorite, uh, even more than the Startling 49, which says a lot, um, is this one, uh, Wonder 15. I always love this cover. Um, I love the bondage of the uh, position. I like the fact that she's like, you know, um, you know, when you put specimens on the like little, um, on the microscope, you kind of have these little things, these little doohickeys, and you got this giant with the little um, scalpel. Um, going to cut her in half, going to dissect her. So he's put her under the microscope, literally under the microscope. And um, I just love the details that he puts in, in terms of the very functional looking uh, equipment. I think that's really cool. And um, I just I just love this. Uh, it, it really shows that uh, Alex Schomburg was a technical artist. He, he didn't just, you know, put doohickeys for the sake of doohickeys. He gave them reason and usage and it seems like it could be something where you would adjust this or tweak that and it would have a practical purpose um i just think that's really cool um i like the way her pose is too and again this is a typical alex schomburg situation where you got the hero hero being a little bit too late uh there's no way he's going to be able to stop the guy from <laughs> slicing her in half just a really really cool comic um, and the greens on this are really interesting as well. So um, this is my favorite uh, Alex Schomburg uh, Good Girl art cover. And um, I just like, I like the hand and stuff. I just think it's really cool. Again, this is this little, that layering, like where you got foreground, midground, and background. Like all kind of gives you that depth of the comic cover, which I really enjoy. So those are my favorite uh, Alex Schomburg covers. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, and, um, if you have a question you want answered, put it in the comments below. If you can, uh, in the description of this video, there is a link where you can vote for this channel. If you like this channel, please vote for this channel. You can vote for it three times for best unboxings, for best spec, and which is my, my uh, Saturday and Sunday shows, or Sundays and Monday shows, I should say, and my best unboxing. So if you like my unboxings. And then the third one is for the Monday special that I do with Steven and definitely vote for both of us. If I win that, I'm going to give my award to him because he deserves it. Um, so um, definitely check those video, those uh, the link out. Vote for us. Um, that'd be really greatly appreciated. Thanks again for watching. Bye for now.